Kenya's Supreme Court has unanimously validated the presidential election result of the vote held last August, which saw Vice President William Ruto declared winner with 50.5% of the vote against 48.8% of his frontline rival Raila Odinga. Plus, the military government of Mali and Burkina Faso have both resolved to strengthen relation ties to beef up diplomacy, economy and health sectors of their respective countries. They took the resolution over the weekend in Bamako, Mali. Those are my big stories, ladies and gentlemen. Stand by for development of this and more in a moment. Good evening, Africa. Thanks for joining us. I am Tekewana at the anchor. We begin this day from Kenya, where the Supreme Court of Kenya has validated, validated William Ruto's August 9 presidential results after days of examination of petitions fight in by opposition party leaders. We are told that this marks the new beginning in Kenya's political life. Details in this report. Like a bombshell, the news break on the unanimous validation of the one-time chicken seller William Ruto as president of the Republic of Kenya after days of examination of petitions filed by his August 9 presidential rival, Raila Odinga. According to the Chief Justice and President of the Supreme Court, Martha Kome, the electoral rupture is insufficient to invalidate or annul the vote. Judges also found no credible evidence that there was any temporary. With the uploading of Forms 34A to the public portal and no evidence of unexplained discrepancies between vote cast in various elective positions across the country and those cast in favor of the Vice President William Ruto. The lawsuit had sought to overturn the result of the presidential election and has left the East African nation in political limbo. However, opposition leader Raila Odinga, who failed to secure the presidency on his fifth attempt, along with six other parties, petitioned the court to nullify Vice President William Ruto's win. They had alleged massive irregularities that compromised the fairness of the August 9 vote, in which official results showed Ruto secured 50.5% support and the veteran opposition figure Odinga clinched just 48.8%. Meanwhile, a total of 5,000 local observers said the results were in line with its own parallel tallies. During the last presidential election in 2017, the Supreme Court overturned the election and ordered a new vote a first in Africa. The hustle in chief now mounts the highest political office in Kenya at a challenging time when the nation is battling to recover its economy from COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine shocks. Elections in Kenya have repeatedly been sources of violence, the deadliest being in 2007, which left more than 1,100 people dead in politically motivated clashes and displaced hundreds of thousands. Although the current electoral process has been largely peaceful, fears remain for any potential unrest. Ella Ron Odinga had promised to accept the verdict of the Supreme Court with the verdict now proclaimed. It is hoped the different political barons in Kenya shall accept the win of change and join forces. We leave Kenya to go down to Mali where the president of the transitional government in Burkina Faso, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Damibam, was over the weekend in Bamako for a walking visit, being the first since he took over power on January 24. Photo has the outcome of his visit in Bamako. The president of the Malian transition, Colonel Asimi Goita, gave a warm welcome to his counterpart from Burkina Faso, Colonel Paul Henry Sandaogo Damiba. The president of Faso, after the welcome with honors, the two head of state had a one-on-one -on -one meeting at the Kuluba Palace. Subsequently, the audience will be extended to the delegations of the two transition presidents. The exchanges between the two personalities focus on bilateral cooperation and issues of common interest. We made a friendly visit to Mali today as part of the cooperation that exists between Burkina Faso and Mali, but it was also fashionable for us who are in a period of transition to come to the authorities of the Republic of Mali to have a framework for sharing and exchange around the challenges faced by the transition of the Mali side and also on the Burkina Faso side, declared President Damiba of his visit. A visit that comes at the time when three soldiers of the 49 Havoran mercenaries detained in Mali since July 10th have been released. This trip by President Paul Henry Damiba to Mali is his very first trip abroad since he took power in Burkina Faso on January 24, 2022. 
It should be noted that after the Mali destination, Lieutenant Colonel Sandaogo Damiba will go to the Ivory Coast this Monday, September 5th, Given the tension that is training to relationship between Abidjan and Bamako, it is therefore important for Africans to learn to accept their mistakes. It is therefore important for Africans to learn to accept their mistakes and reconcile when necessary. And as you heard from that report from Fotso, one of the biggest shock of the weekend was the release of three women who were among the 49 Iran soldiers that have been detained for close to seven weeks. And our reporter, Jigs Nabise, took keen interest on this diplomatic constraint of relationship between Bamako and Abidjan. And here comes our report. Three women who were among the 49 Ivorian soldiers detained in Mali were released over the weekend. State television said around seven weeks since the arrest of the troops sparked a diplomatic spot between the West African neighbors. The soldiers had been apprehended at the Bamako Modi Bukata International Airport. On July 10, and Mali's military government said they had flown in without permission and were seen as mercenaries. Ivory Coast, which has repeatedly requested for the release, says the soldiers had been deployed as part of a security and logistics support contract signed with the United Nations Peacekeeping Mission in Mali. Both Malian and Ivorian state television said three women in the group had been freed. The Togolese government announced recently that the three women had been released. Mali is struggling to rein in an Islamic insurgency which took root after an uprising and a coup in 2012 and has seen spread to neighboring countries, killing thousands and displacing millions across West Africa's Sahel region and coastal states. The military government ruling Mali since August 2020 has been at odds with regional and international neighbors for failing to hold promised elections and delaying a return to constitutional order. Mali's transitional government and former rebel groups have resumed talks after almost a year. The talks had us aim to reintegrate into the army of over 26,000 rebel groups who have dropped their arms. Mwanzi, tell us more. Mali's transitional government and former rebel groups have resumed talks after almost a year from the negotiating table. Over the weekend, an alliance of Tuareg and Arab rebel groups, pro-government armed groups and the government met with the monitoring committee of the Algiers Agreement signed in 2015 to discuss the reintegration of 26,000 rebels who have dropped down their arms. Algerian Minister of Foreign Affairs Ramtan Lamnara noted that the talks have been constructive. A number of observations were made, he says. The comments that were made by the government representative were satisfactory in content and tone. And I'm confident that at our next meeting we will make even more significant progress. Head of the coordination of Azawad movement, Atai Ag Mohamed, is cautiously optimistic about the talks. He says the government of Mali and the parties have once again reiterated the commitment to work for the full and consensual implementation of the Peace and Reconciliation Agreement. This is a strong message, but we expect action. Mohamedou Diaora, Chief of Staff of the Ministry of National Reconciliation of Mali, noted that the negotiations are a good step forward. What is more important is that all the Malian parties have renewed their mutual trust, he says. And they are in the process of giving each other the benefit of good faith in dealing with the issues. Mali, like many African countries since independence, has witnessed political turmoil and jihadist insurgencies since 2012. Let's now go over to the Horn of Africa, precisely in Somalia, where it is not only about hunger and drought that the Horn of Africa is facing, but as well as insecurity for over several months now. Recently, over the weekend, we are told that over 19 persons lost their lives in an attack while hundreds are missing, with their fate still not known. Our reporter, Manzi, completes the story for us. Over 19 civilians have been killed in an attack by Al-Shabaab Islamist militants on a road in central Somalia over the weekend. According to local officials and clan leaders, 
at least eight passenger minibuses and trucks traveling on a road between the towns of Belenduin and Maxus were intercepted, bundled, and set on fire, killing their passengers. The attackers are also said to have abducted several other people whose fate remains unknown. The ambush comes just two weeks after a deadly Mogadishu siege by the Islamist group which left 21 people dead and 117 injured. In a statement, the extremists announced that they had targeted fighters from a local sub-clan. Somalia's president on his part condemned the despicable acts by the terrorist group. Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, who has been facing a resurgence of extremist activity since his election in May, promised that the government will spare no effort in the fight against terrorism. In August, security forces and local fighters announced that they had recaptured several villages previously under Al-Shabaab control. Al-Shabaab, an Al-Qaeda-linked group existent in Somalia since 2006, describes itself as waging jihad against enemies of Islam and is engaged in fighting against the federal government of Somalia and the African Union mission to Somalia. Let's talk health now, beginning with uh, measles, which of course is rocking uh, a country called Zimbabwe. Uh, close to 700 children have lost their lives to a measles outbreak in Zimbabwe since April this year. The Southern African Country's Health Ministry has announced over the weekend, despite ongoing vaccination campaign in the country, as our reporter, our student journalist of internship, Ewane Epole, reports. The Ministry of Health declared on Saturday, September 4th, that the outbreak of measles in Zimbabwe has so far claimed the lives of over 685 individuals. This figure is more than four times the cases reported almost two weeks ago, even though a nationwide vaccination is ongoing. We've come to Mutasa district to investigate the um, measles outbreak. There's not been uh, measles cases for more than 10 years and um, all of a sudden cases were recorded and we need to find out why measles has re-emerged in Mutasa district and to also find out the response. What we found out is um, most cases that are um, most the deaths that were recorded um, are not vaccinated and uh, we have most of the cases being unvaccinated as well and only the few that have uh, the measles have mild symptoms. The situation is obviously getting worse day by day according to the minister's publication on Twitter in which he stated that Zimbabwe had 6,034 confirmed cases and 685 deaths followed by 191 new cases and 37 deaths reported on a single day on September 1st. Monica Mutsvangwa, the country's information minister, said last month that children within the range of 6 months and 15 years old were not strong enough to resist the disease, especially those from religious sects that do not believe in vaccination. The letter equally said that the government is reaching out to faith leaders to gather support and awareness. The government claims the apostolic sect is responsible for the higher spread of measles since they don't believe in vaccination but rather rely on prayers. However, the apostolic church till now have not reacted to these claims made on them by the government. And still talking about health, we want to talk now about skin whitening, which of course has become very lucrative in the African continent over the years. Health experts have advised governments to caution their population on the risk impact this could lead to. Details in this report. Skin whitening has for over the years gained firm grounds in the African continent, especially amongst the youthful population. Why some do it as a result of peer pressure, Others simply embrace it as a way of life. From Dhaka, Senegal, down to Lagos, Nigeria, Accra in Ghana, and Yaoundé, Cameroon, the story is not different, as they all do it to stand out in the crowd, to smooth out imperfections, and to get ready for a special event or a date. 
It is a personal choice. No one pressures me. Some women want to be black every day, but I prefer to be a shade of brown. It's better for me. I like it. Not that users are not usually informed about the negative effect the different skin whitening products have like stretch marks and infections, but yet many still go in for the product. This one.